Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick, and we're here for this week's episode of Friday Morning GM with my co-host, Voss Laricos. Voss, how you doing? Doing well, Ken. Good to see the Ravens uh, checking some of the boxes off, fleshing out the roster a little bit to the start of free agency. How are you making out? Doing fine myself. Bit busy as hell for the Ravens here and, and busy as hell with uh, draft prep and whatnot because those shows are starting up in uh, – about a week and a half or so, and and we'll be running for about two weeks. A very very strenuous time, probably the most strenuous time of the year for me in terms of of uh, uh, writing and recording shows. Mm-hmm. Sure, it's busy time of year. All right, so the big the big news today was the Josh Jones signing. So addresses their uh, tackle needs in some fairly small way, um, as far as I'm concerned. Guy who's kind of struggled in four NFL seasons. So what do you think about it? Um, you know, I think it's a good move to add some flexibility to the uh, the offensive line situation after the departures. Potentially could be a swing tackle. Also has a little bit of experience as a guard. Uh, maybe that's where they could uh, find some value uh, by, by shifting him inside. Potentially 21 starts for Arizona over his first three seasons and then three starts last year in Houston, although mixed results. Yeah, he's uh, one of the most penalized players in the entire NFL uh, over the course of his career. We used to say that about John Simpson. Wait till you hear the numbers for Josh Jones. They're a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, So uh, uh, he's still one of the youngest offensive tackles on the market at 27, which I think if you you want to start with the glasses half full, that would be it. In terms of the penalties, was something we really hoped the offensive line coaches of the Ravens, being among the best in the league, would be able to fix that did not work out in Simpson's case in terms of both frequency and severity that virtually identical to what had happened before in Mm -hmm. his, in his career with the Raiders, Josh Jones, 26 penalties in 1,762 NFL snaps his career. That's one every 67.8. He does play tackle. You pick up a couple more penalties at tackle, but uh, you know, compares, for example, to Simpson, who had one every 95 or has one every 95.5 career. Uh, so it's 41% more penalties per snap for Josh Jones. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that uh, seems to be an issue that's pretty hard to rectify once the players sort of get the, those bad habits, the grabby, um, you know, the, the quick scouting report, heavy hands, but also heavy feet. So, uh, yep. you know, not a great combination. Um PFF charted him for nine pressures over 151 pass protection snaps um, last season. Also projected the contract to be uh, Brad did two years, 13 million. So we'll see where it comes in. Wouldn't be surprised if the Ravens drove a hard bargain there. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised either. I I wouldn't be surprised if it's a one-year deal since we haven't heard otherwise at this point. I think we would have by now, at least that it's a two-year deal, you know. But uh, but we'll see, and uh, and it could be it could be more complicated than that. It could be you know that the, the Ravens have an option for a second year or that you know right. things exist in there. But uh, uh, most contracts, like the Henry contract, is really a, an option contract for the Ravens for that second year. But uh, yep. uh, let's talk a little bit more about the penalties because it's the huge part about Jones. Ten stole drives already in his career. That, that is a very large number. Um, in in terms of you know the number of total drives he's been involved in offensively and and uh, once that he stalled the Cardinals actually gave up on him after three years so they they you know the Arizona Cardinals are not known for their tackle depth though they developed a little bit through the draft but they've had some horrible tackles over the year and after three years they traded him for a fifth round pick despite the whack fact that PFF actually graded him the best they'd ever did in 2022. They graded him in the 70s in pretty much all categories. And with the barriers to entry at left tackle, that's maybe the most damning piece of evidence about him, is the Cardinals said, you know, we just can't live with this anymore um, after three years. Yes, I'd agree. You know, uh, it seems like pretty much a reclamation project signing, potentially. I do like the age that he is young. He does have a relatively high draft pedigree. Um, some are speculating that this may signal McCary as the starting right tackle over Falele. I wasn't sure if you thought that was uh, the direction this, that this uh, leads them to. 
I don't immediately get led to that. I saw Gordon McGinnis had, had posted that, and, and I respect Gordon a lot, but I don't. that's not the conclusion I would come to. Uh, McCary has been a very good backup left tackle. And when you say that, what does a very good backup left tackle in the NFL look like that day? He's above the replacement level if you mm-hmm. had to go to him. And that's what, exactly what McCary is. He's not good, but he's above the replacement level. And that's a that's – that's a very solid place to be. The Ravens are paying him four four point four million this year to be a backup left tackle. If he went and played guard or right tackle or anything else, I think it would be a um, potential reduction in his value. Not only would he, but you know, it doesn't really have the strength or the power to to, to play right tackle. Um, but he, but he also, um, if if you lose him over there and he can't play left tackle at some point, as happened with Tyree Phillips in 2021, you just have a, a a much worse situation on your hands. So I think he stays as the backup left tackle. That'd be my guess. I'm guessing a starter, a, a draft pick, or Jones ends up being, or 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 potentially Falele ends up being the starting right tackle. But the Ravens are running into a position now where they're going to potentially have to cut a tackle anyway if you look at it they're they've got you know they've got stanley who's on the roster for one more year they've got jones is on the roster for one or two more years probably we don't know exactly at this point because we don't know the terms of the agreement we're recording this by the way um on thursday afternoon but uh, uh, not, we, the, the, the report is not yet out about uh, about what's occurred with that. So, you know, just in terms of the, the Falele is on currently a two year plan before he's out of here. In terms of his mm-hmm. uh, time being up, he's actually potentially on the cut list for this year. And then if they if they get a draft pick, depending on where they get him, the, they may have a, another developmental player that needs to take up a roster spot. Right. I think they're pretty much capped out at 10 offensive linemen on the final 53, and they're pretty much at eight right now. Um, so probably looking to draft two. I think best case scenario would probably be that Falele does build upon the steps he showed towards the end of last season, where uh, where he did improve his footwork to some extent and was playing much better than he had in previous years. So when you're looking at the offensive line as a whole, it seems that an early tackle that can get into the mix with a right tackle competition or potentially be Ronnie Stanley's succession plan at the left tackle is the real primary need. Um, Maybe without Mustafa, they could keep five tackles. um, And then that would be 10 if if they don't necessarily have a true backup center, but I think it's 10 is the final number. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in the end, I think you if you if you want to lean on that flexibility, then having an extra tackle like Jones, who in theory could play guard, you are kind of carrying an extra guard that way. So you could you could live with that. You you really are banking then on a couple of unknowns. In well, Vori's in particular is a tremendous unknown. He's he might be the most important offensive player for the Ravens this coming year. Derrick Henry is important too, of course. What Lamar does it has still a lot of variability, but after those couple of guys, you, you, and maybe Bateman, you get down to a player like like Voorhees and what he could do for the Ravens. Because if he has a big year, it affects the Ravens over multiple years, not just one. Cleveland, if he has a big year, it's great. Might give the Ravens a comp pick, but it doesn't really have a long lasting impact on the Ravens the way a, a big year from Voorhees would as a rookie, effectively a rookie. He'd be a year one player this year because of the NFI. Agreed. That's best case scenario. Falele, like I mentioned, build, builds upon his strong finish. Vorty steps up, and Cleveland is given when actually penciled in with the job, runs with it, and maybe the, the offensive line is not as doom and gloom as some are currently uh, projecting. So we'll see. But uh, hopefully the number for Jones comes in at, at a reasonable price tag considering his, his grading and his penalty history. Right. I w- would agree with that. Um, anything else I need to say about this? Won't affect the Ravens' comp picks as far as I, I can uh, see in terms of the number. But it well may mean one of their sixes becomes a seven. And again, it depends on the number. It could even be a little bit worse than that, but there could be a downgrade here in, in terms of this. I am not at a point yet where I can say whether this affects the clowny signing because I don't know the amount involved. But I have to think there's risk that that – it's less likely today than it was yesterday that Jadavian Clowney be a Raven in 2024. I would agree. Apparently he's visiting the Jets and, um, you know, it's all interconnected. 
the cap space is a finite resource and every move is connected to another one indirectly even when the, even when they push the money off into next year or down the road with void mm -hmm. years that's still that bill comes due essentially on the topic of outside linebackers the market is drying up faster than i anticipated they're pretty much down to Clowney, kyle van Noy, bud dupree carl lawson and manny agba and those are pretty much the five starting caliber outside linebackers left and we did the show a few weeks ago and we, you know, i think there was 15 outside linebackers in the top 150 and uh they, they uh, several of them went off the board faster than i thought okay well that's it's not completely expected obviously but also I, I i'm not sure that top 150 includes a lot of the types of players the ravens have gone for over the last several years where they've, they've dipped into the bargain bin like would jason pierre paul have been on the top 150 i'm, I'm not sure right. he would have been so mm -hmm. uh, anyway, they, they, I, I'm not sure it necessarily means the Ravens are completely out of options. And also, a lot of those guys tend to get caught late after the draft, after the teams think they have their new person, they uh, uh, they cut loose their current guy. Mm -hmm. we, we did learn that Morgan Moses played with a torn pec, he said, in 2023. Uh, warrior, obviously, but but maybe, maybe explains a little bit of why the Ravens decided they had to move on with this trade. Um, I'm not sure if I quite see it that way. If he was able to play through it and still play reasonably well, and now he's had surgery six weeks ago, there's one way to look at it is to say he's potentially going to be better next year with a, with a healthy, you know, without that restriction. But, um, you know, they, they made the decision, obviously a lot of turnover overhauling the offensive line. And that was one of the decisions they made. So we'll see. We'll see uh, how it goes. All right. Let's talk. Uh, keep keep it on the plus side right now, which are some of the other new signings in terms of, of, of adding players. Uh, Mollett re-signed for two years. Uh, solid play in 2023. I have not seen contract details, but he played 35 percent of the snaps as the nickel. Most of those on passing downs when Hamilton was moved back to the back end. Hamilton, the more common early down big nickel player. I like Mollett. I think he's physical. I like the way he plays. He's a good blitzer. He's pretty pretty uh, tight coverage, at least at the first and second level. Maybe, obviously, we saw Valdez Scantling uh, got him over the top, up the seam. But um, a little surprised that they decided to bolster slot cornerback before perimeter cornerback. If you look at the roster, they have essentially five players who have all shown signs of playing well in the slot versus only two um, on the perimeter. So a little bit surprising there. I'm not sure if this means that uh, Hamilton will be, be playing deep uh, more often next year. Yeah, I, I, I would not be particularly happy with that. I want him to be a, you know somebody that can play anybody, but primarily as the nickel. But in, when you talk about the, the relationship between deep and slot corners, you have Humphrey and Stevens as being – uh, the outside guys who are who are plus, and then you have Washington, Mollett, uh, and who else in terms of slot corner guys? Hum, so Hamilton, hum, Hamilton, Humphrey, Humphrey again, and okay. I think and I think Pepe, his rookie year, I have more confidence in Pepe in the slot than I do in Armor Davis on the boundary at this point. Um, That's fair. So that, that could go either way, but a lot of options there. Um, I really don't want them to draft a slot only cornerback in the draft now. I will say that. Yeah, I, I can. I, I mean, I might not have wanted that anyway. If if you've got mm -hmm. Hamilton around, you, you you probably don't want to waste somebody on somebody you, you you know who is best served playing for a team that will play you know ninety three percent of the snaps in nickel or ninety two percent. It's it's a yeah. I I I I wouldn't want that. Um, Mullet, I I there's things I like about him. He's a feisty downhill player. I like him as a hitter. Uh, does have kind of a high missed tackle rate. That's a little bit troublesome at twenty percent. And I think if you want to pick the cornerback who benefited most from the Ravens' two high looks, I think it might be Mollett. Um, mm -hmm. did, did pretty well also because the inside linebackers actually gave up 8.2 yards per target for the year. That doesn't include the – actually, no, I think it does include the postseason as well with that. But, uh, it, you know, not, not great in, in terms of the Ravens' general level. Modestly surprised that they re-signed him for two years. Where are you on that? 
Yeah, 30 years old. So, you know, a lot of corners hit that 30-year-old marker. Same as running backs. Those are probably the two positions where once you turn 30, it gets a little dicey. A little bit surprised. You know, maybe it's just playing some some cap gymnastics um, as well. I think they probably also value him as a special teams core uh, performer. So maybe that's where it is. But I, I'm I'm hoping this is pretty darn close to the veteran minimum and uh, and not a, a little bit too generous of a number there for Mullet. Right. I, I certainly wouldn't want it to be two years, five million. Let's put it that way. So uh, if it's he had two hundred thousand in guaranteed money last year, so he didn't come here with a with zero leverage with the Ravens. Mm-hmm. He, you know, he, he might, must have had other offers if if they got to a point where he had two hundred thousand guaranteed. So uh, anyway, you know, not a bad player by any stretch. And by the way, he was in there primarily on the passing down snap. So I would expect his his yards per target number to be or to have more challenging assignments in terms of coverage. Let's put it that way. And and probably end up with a yards per target that's a little higher. Uh, but it, it was uh, primarily Hamilton on those early downs uh, playing more. He slumped a little bit towards the end of the year, Mullet. About three quarters of the way through the year, he had very pretty some gaudy some gaudy yards per target numbers, and then the last quarter of the year where they started picking on him a little bit. Yeah. All right, let's move on to Josh Johnson. Um, <laughs> this is a bridge move, clearly. Uh, you mentioned, I think, before the show that he'd been signed for $1.2 million, so it seems like mm-hmm. at or, or very close to the vet minimum. Yeah. Guaranteed. That's the, that's the key part is it's $1.2 guaranteed. So uh, that's according to Brian McFarland. Um, perhaps he's the backup quarterback. Uh, you know, I, I hope that they can get away with only rostering two quarterbacks on the 53. Last year they had three the entire year, even four towards the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, so to guarantee that, to have that guaranteed, I think uh, should probably pencil him in as the backup. I, I would think so, and and we may be living in a time where where teams really feel like they need to carry three because the extra third player activation on game day that you get, um, I don't think there's enough of an incentive for that to make it something you have to do. But I think it, when it, it, it when it occasionally comes up, you've usually lost the game anyway because your starting quarterback is out, your second quarterback is out, you've usually lost the game anyway. So it's not that much of a bonus to to bring in a right. uh, another uh, Malik Cunningham instead of say Willie Sneed from years ago or Derrick Henry. I think Derrick Henry could be the emergency quarterback <laughs> based there on the place he's put out um, in, throughout his career. Yeah, I, I don't think we'd be calling any passing plays, but you might you might call a passing player too. <laughs> Uh, I, I just the only thing I could I think of when I think of a Josh Johnson signing, a guy at 38 years old coming in and being the backup quarterback is, in the words of Marge Simpson, "Let us never speak of him again." <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear his name. Okay, yeah, he's going to be the, the the second or the third quarterback on every 53 man roster projection we have to make, and we're going to do a two player show on him this this summer and whatnot. But uh, the less we hear Josh Johnson's name the entire season, the better. Absolutely. Absolutely true. All right. Chris Board. Um, I, I, I have not seen officially that he signed. I did I did see that it was uh, projected to happen, so I assume it is. But the Ravens haven't put it out on their uh, on, on their Twitter yet. Last I looked, which was about an hour ago. Um, mm-hmm. I'm assuming this is at or near the vet minimum also should not affect comp picks in any way. Um, special teams, backup blank role. What are you seeing? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think more of a will backup will maybe, maybe gets in the mix with Simpson as some type of specialty package uh, where Simpson would come off the field and he would go on. But, you know, nine yards per target over his career. I know the Ravens and Wink Martindale were using him as sort of a, a dime linebacker, even sort of, even though he is a linebacker and, uh, I wasn't very impressed. I think he's more just of a Delshawn Phillips special teams ace replacement. Yeah, I mean Delshawn Phillips is is good. Delshawn Phillips mm-hmm. could play linebacker as well, and and uh, we we didn't get a great look at at a lot of Delshawn Phillips, but in camp and and was making plays every day. Uh, Chris Board is not a guy you want on the field at linebacker at this point in his career. I, I'm not sure he ever was. I know there is one of the Baltimore analysts, Denard Melton, who feels extremely strongly about this, and will will he, he just. Every time Chris Board comes out with a with a you know a, a whole spew of bile comes out at the yeah. same time about the player, but 
uh, respect uh, uh, Denard, by the way. That's uh, uh, it, it, Ward's not had a great career in coverage, that's for certain. And the Ravens tried to shoehorn him into that role, um, as you mentioned, boss. Yes, yes. So last time they signed him, it was – I think two and a half million for one year, which I thought was a little bit of an overpay. Hopefully this is closer to the veteran minimum. Um, and I think it probably lessens the need of drafting a linebacker. If he's going to be one of your backups and maybe Josh Ross is your other backup, you're probably four, four inside linebackers. You're probably in good shape there. Yeah, I, I would think so. And then your your fifth inside linebacker, if you have one, um, is a dime back. It's not a, it's not mm-hmm. a, uh, uh, a, a true linebacker or it's or it's Harrison who is the next guy we ought to talk about in terms of, of moving on to the contract details on some of these previous signings because we didn't know all these last week when right. you know a lot of these were announced but Malik Harrison I was really surprised to see that that's a one year 2.6 million dollar deal I, it uh I think you got to look at every single one of these with with tremendous scrutiny and I just that's that's more than I would have expected it to be so on the bright side, according to Brian, this uh, this contract, the Ravens used the four-year qualifying contract, which they haven't used since Anthony Levine. The advantage is it takes that $2.6 million payout. It only counts $1.1 million against the cap. Oh, fantastic. So from that, okay. from that, so, so this is sort of that veteran benefit where you get to pay them more, but it counts less on the cap so that so that all the veterans don't get pushed out of the out of the league, um, they were able to take advantage of that. So I'm very happy with this contract with that number. I am completely in agreement. And 1.5 million of Steve Bishotti's money, you can spend that on rings. You can spend that on this. <laughs> um, I want you to spend it on rings, but I, <laughs> I do want to, uh, I, I I like this, and I like money spent on assistant coaches as well. So that's uh, definitely that, that's well done. Um, okay, Matabike, four years, ninety-eight million. I noticed there's eleven million dead in 2028. Was the big new yep. news for me coming out of this? So, two void uh, years. Two void years. It's that it was originally reported as a straight four-year contract. Actually, has two void years, eleven million. So they're basically, you know, uh, borrowing about ten percent of the contract value for the yep. void years. So, yep. and uh, the the t- the tough years will come in twenty. 20- 26 and 27 when he'll be over 30 million or at, at or over 30 million both years. Uh, so it's going to become a very expensive contract, but it's affordable this year. Don't let that fool you. You know, the Ravens are going to have to pay up on this, uh, on, on basically this entire deal. The, the, the only year he can reasonably be cut is the last one mm-hmm. um, in, in 27. So uh, uh, Justin Matabike really needs to play like Justin Matabike did this last year. Um, to really get tremendous value out of this contract. Yeah, that's becoming a little bit of a pet peeve of mine of people saying the cap hit is only this for the first year without looking at the guarantees down the road and how they kind of you know mix and match and push it off. And people use that as a way to justify every move, but I don't quite see it that way. Yeah, it's, it's, that's complete horseshit thinking. I'm, 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 I'm just I am I'm so bothered by that. And you get into this and and that's it is the general way that most fans think is they have a 2024 only view of the team in terms of, of, of so many things. Uh, it bothers me no end. It bothers me in terms of, as we discussed on this show before, the difference between saving cap and deferring cap. They are very different things. Saving cap, you cut the guy's salary this year, he doesn't play for you like Moses, for example, is 5.5 million saved from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I even say it's less than that because you have to replace Moses with somebody who's going to cost you about a million dollars at the minimum. So it's really 4.5 saved. But anyway, that's that's the saved number. You call it 4.5, call it 5.5, you're fine. If if the, um, in terms of the deferred number, um, you know, you, you if you put off cap like they did with OBJ and you know mm-hmm. move the void years out a year, you're not saving cap. <laughs> you're you're, right. you're deferring caps. So. Yes, Exa- completely agree there, and I think that needs to be uh, understood and co- incorporated into these discussions a little bit better. Yes, yeah, well, it needs to be part of the lexicon, part part of how we discuss this 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 thing uh, in general. Let's move on to the Stanley restructure. Uh, 2025, where he was certainly going to be cut because there's a $20 million savings, actual savings, $20 million salary the Ravens wouldn't mm-hmm. pay, um, uh, was not going to be paid. But now they've turned that into a uh, free agency year, actually a void year. Um, and 
I believe under the current contract, although there may be rules on restructures of this type, I believe now he becomes eligible for a comp pick after if he becomes a free agent after 2024. It would be in the 2026 yes. draft, but I believe that's the case. So if he had a big year, looks like Ronnie Stanley again. Hopefully the Ravens can extend him, but if they can't, then somebody else gets him and the Ravens get a get a comp pick. And it, and it might be a good one because, hey, he's a left tackle. Yes, I, it, that is the way it's – that that is the rule. As I understand it, if a player that is released due void years is still eligible. Mm-hmm. Um, two, two takeaways from this, half a million dollar game bonus for every game. So No, no, it's, a, it's half a million in total for all games. I did ask that question of Brian. It's, it's like 30000 or 29000 per game. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I thought that was – well – um, anyway, ten million not likely to be earned. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if he plays the full season and, and earns that, then that that money will hit on next year's cap. Uh, but it seems like a good deal for me. I, I thought the game bonuses were more, but uh, either way, I, I think that is a good incentive for for Ronnie. Yeah, I I thought so too, and I thought that's a perfect way to incent contract. I sent Ronnie on a one year deal with the Ravens that eight and a half tie up eight and a half million of his total in can you dress for the game kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's not like the Ravens would ever want to be without Ronnie Stanley for that kind of number so per game. So I I don't think Ronnie should have any fear from the organization. Now that might change if the Ravens have a real down year and they're, you know, they're five and okay. Now let's just make it worse. Let's say they're two and nine at some point this year. They might decide they want to sit Ronnie and, and, and uh, kill off the per game bonuses you could get from it. Then, then that would be a, That'd be pretty risky in my view. I think that would sour some agents yeah, to the Ravens. Set bad uh, that for that, I mean, certain things I think, but but deactivating a healthy player with a game bonus would be pretty uh, pretty pretty shady. <laughs> it is it is a Raiders staple. Let me tell you that is to cut that guy. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, I, there are teams in the National Football League who aren't ashamed reputationally of what it will mean. But I, mm-hmm. I, admittedly, a lot of those teams are teams with a lot less to lose, like the Raiders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Sure. All right, let's move on and talk about Derrick Henry's contract and what we now know that we didn't last week. It's essentially a one-year deal for $9 million with a 2025 option for another $7 million. So, And then there's a $4 million in, in incentives, as I understand it, over those two years to be earned. No void years on the contract currently. Now, that could change. They may they may uh, whip into that next year, but they uh, um, if if they want to be out after one year, it'll cost them nine million. If they if he plays both years, it'll cost them sixteen million, and then there's incentives also to be earned whether he plays one or two years. Correct. Yep. Five point one million dollar cap hit in two thousand twenty four. Ten point nine million dollar cap hit in two thousand twenty five. If they do release him after this year, they save the six million dollar base salary, and the cap hit for the twenty five season is reduced by the same six million. So, it's a, it's one of the interesting things about what you said is the deferral is not nothing, but it's not enormous on this contract. That there's only a three point nine million dollar deferral on Henry into twenty five. Mm-hmm. which actually for a player of his stature makes that contract more attractive than I originally thought. Mm-hmm. All right. I still, I still think that, that the, the way that this, okay. If Derrick Henry does what he's done in four of the past five seasons and leads the NFL in carries, I don't think it will be Derrick Henry's fault when it does not work out or if it does mm-hmm. not work out that, that, you know, it'll probably be a case of the offensive line lets him down. Um, with the problems they have there. But I do think, as we've mentioned on previous shows, that you're making a choice here between a back who has been very productive in this system in Gus Edwards and a back who's been um, productive but not does not have great rate statistics, in particular the success rate um, it, with Tennessee, uh, who, who does it in volume, uh, and you want that guy instead. And I just, you know, again, it may be a case of can the Ravens really find a similar stylistic fit that is a third or less of the cost? Yes, yes. One way I've just opposed this sort of debate and tried to frame it as Derrick Henry versus Davian Clowney. Mm-hmm. What's more impactful, adding a .2 war running back to the NFL's number one rushing offense or subtracting a .35 war outside linebacker from the NFL's number one pass defense? For me personally, I think it's Clowney 
pretty pretty easy, easy choice. Yeah, I mean, I I, I want Clowney over uh, over uh, Henry if it came down to that decision. I'm still hopeful they can get both, but the way Henry is, uh, sorry, the way Clowney is um, uh, doing the whole North American tour right now, I I don't think it really looks that great for him resigning with the Ravens. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Time will tell. All right. Johnson, one year, 1.2 million. I think we talked about that already. Um, uh, that's great. That's exactly what you want to pay for your backup quarterback if you can. I, I actually think the Ravens may be going for a reset this year, by the way. They clearly need to reset at the position and get a cheap player. Uh, Johnson is a simple one-year Band-Aid. At least that's the way I'd see it. Maybe he'll be playing at 41. Who knows? But um, you know, he's 38 this year. It's, mm-hmm. I just, it's not. You don't want that. I, I don't think that provides you anything as a backup quarterback in terms of true insurance for Lamar. Now, do the Ravens have anything if they lose Lamar? Probably not. But I, I, I really hate for a season to be flushed just the moment you know he gets hurt and has to miss four games. Say, mm-hmm. uh, yes, that's always a thing. If it's a short-term injury, can you can you bridge to the return of of your MVP cal- you know MVP quarterback? I guess Malik Cunningham could still factor into the mix. Um, could draft somebody. Could find the next UDFA. Um, but apparently Huntley went to Cleveland on just a one-year deal. Um, I don't I haven't seen terms, but it looks to be pretty cheap. Um, I probably would have preferred Huntley to Johnson if the cost was the same. Is is uh, I, I'm I, I would not disagree with that. By the way, um, and I think he was a vet min guy. I think it might have been the exact same amount because Huntley made something like two point seven million this last year on his RFA year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, might actually might have been less than that. They might have reduced it because one of the one of the interesting. Hey guys, I want to tell you about the Ufi video lock. Because when I'm not podcasting, I am. My day job is a smart home specialist. And the Eufy Video Smart Lock is perfect. This is what you guys need to go get. It replaces the deadbolt on your door. So now you can come home without fumbling with keys. You can just type in a code. Or, even better, use your fingerprint to unlock. After one second, you put your finger there, pops out, my door's open. It's perfect. It also is an integrated video doorbell. We've all seen the video doorbells. We all know the ones that are out there. I've seen many of them get stolen. No one's going to steal this because it's your door lock. It's impossible for them to steal. There's no monthly fee. Other ones do. But this one, it'll record locally, so you never have to pay if you don't want to. The battery, it lasts up to four months. Plus, it notifies you ahead of time. And I mentioned earlier one-second fingerprint recognition. No, I meant one-second till it opens the ai self learning chip will learn your fingerprint even faster and then it opens up completely keyless entry no more keys and i know i set this up as i'm a smart home specialist but anyone can install this all you need is a phillips screwdriver that's it and then you're done guys i love this product make sure you check it out now here's the easiest thing to do just go on to Google or whatever you prefer and search Eufy Video Lock. That's E-U-F-Y Video Lock. Or visit eufyofficial.com forward slash video lock to see how you can gain complete control of your door just like me, just like Ken. Things about... RFA years is that they're non not guaranteed. So often, and the Ravens had this in the past. I think who was who were the players? Might have been Ryan Jensen and somebody else were were entering their fourth year. And Ryan Jensen broke out as a star that year. But then it might have been James Hurst was another one at the same point in his career at that time. And they just brought them both in and say, "Hey, you're both making 1.2 million. We can't we can't pay you both 2.7 or 2.5 or whatever it was." And so they reduced the salaries of of um, of both of them. I don't know if they announced it to them at the same time, but all of the offensive linemen earn, end up earning the same the same amount that year. Yeah, I, I do recall that happening before, where they exercised it and then rescinded it. Um, so there is some flexibility there as compared with the restricted free agent compared to a fifth year option um, type of, type of arrangement, which is guaranteed. 
In Cleveland, apparently Huntley's going to be competing with Dorian Thompson Robinson for the QB three spot. Um, because wow, they, they give up on Thompson Robinson that quickly. Uh, apparently, because Winston was brought in to back up. Yeah, Watson. you're right. So uh, unless they're going to cut Winston, but they just added, <laughs> they can't cut Watson. He's getting fully guaranteed. <laughs> yeah, you can't cut DTR because he'll be he'll be picked up. But if they 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 could have have Huntley on the practice squad as the year starts and then bring him back as needed to be the QB three. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I would think that's the more likely eventuality for Huntley, but, uh, but we'll see. That's, that's interesting. I mean, the Browns needed every one of four quarterbacks last year to start games. Right. And, and so they, uh, <laughs> uh, they clearly are, are being extra careful at the position. Okay, let's talk about the Michael Gallup visit. Uh, former or former current, I guess, Cowboys receiver, um, I, I'm I'm not that juiced about Michael Gallup. What are your feelings on this? I was a pretty big Michael Gallup fan, even going back to pre-draft, and he had a pretty terrible knee injury uh, about a season and a half ago, and he hasn't quite gained that explosiveness back. I do think he fits the um, – the profile of what they need as far as a perimeter oriented receiver, he lines up about 90% outside. So he's not a slot guy who's going to be a direct competitor for Aguilar. Aguilar pretty much a slot guy at this point. Um, seven and a half yards per target in 23, not great. Uh, that's not great. Um, and I didn't check for his career where he is. Maybe you, maybe you have a better idea than that. And I'll, I'm just looking it up right now. I'm going to take a moment. But yards per target for his career is 7.8. He was actually 5.7 in 22, so and was better early in his career with a peak of 9.8 in 2019. Um, you know, he's played in a Dallas offense with Dak Prescott that I would think would be pretty much tailor made for him, particularly with the other receivers there and the attention they would get. Mm-hmm. Um, did peak out with over 100 targets in both 19 and 20. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it, he's a player who's had four straight. He's had three straight rather. 418 to 445 yard seasons for what that means. And, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, I'm just, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be thrilled with it as signing. And maybe there's a price I think it'd be worth it to have him as the fifth receiver, but I, it's, it's not a, not a player that really excites me. Yeah. I, I'm not overly excited. It could be like an Aguilar though, where you sign him yeah. and then he plays better in their system. He regains, you know, whatever he had lost. I think, I'd like to have four veterans if you can. Um, you still need to have two receivers if you're going to roster six. So you want to take two in the draft or one veteran. If he's cheap, I, I would I would be pretty uh, pretty satisfied with that one. Are you including Wallace in that in that number? You have Wallace as number four right now, or not? Yes, I'm sorry. You're right. He he is. I, I misspoke there. But uh, Wallace would be four. So Aguilar. Uh, Zay Flowers and Rashad Bateman. That's your four receivers, so you need two more to make six. Okay. All right. That that works for me. And then one draft pick, one free agent, which I think is the likely way the Ravens will go. They could go two draft picks. Um, when they've used – where the Ravens have really failed, they have they have been had not great success at number one in terms of drafting receivers. Though Recently, it's been better in that area. Where they've really failed is with mid-round draft picks at wide receiver those guys they they just haven't gotten any value at all out of them uh so anyway the the you know the the jordan throw the ball into the pond lasley and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, jaleel scott and those guys yeah yeah there there's a not this not their forte but i would say um the costa has shot more shots and and done better there you know i did a study a couple of years ago the top 70 if you want year one production out of your receivers, the vast majority come from the top 75 in the draft. Luka Nakua broke out last year, uh, maybe the exception to Cruz. Yeah. 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 Very good. Um, all right. Well, l- let's uh, do some free agency tracking and just make sure we're keeping up with this. Ravens have now lost 10 players, make it 11, I think, actually now. Uh, Duvernay to the Jags, Simpson to the Jets, Stone to the Bengals, Edwards to the Chargers, Darby to the Jags, Ott to the Commanders, Queen to the Steelers, and Delshawn Phillips to the Texans. We know about all those last week, those those eight. Okay, and there are two more this week that we haven't discussed yet. The first is – well, okay, the first is Tyler Huntley. Um, we think it's it's near the, the vet minimum. I thought I saw a tweet that indicated that. 
um, within the last 90 minutes or so. But I might be wrong about that. So we'll, we'll wait and, and make sure that's uh, that's right. I think we may have talked that one out in terms of, of the need to reset at that position. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, hypothetically, you want to have another four-year cheap guy with some with the ability to bridge through if Lamar misses a, a few a few games here or there. Sort of how Huntley was. Um, if you can find the next Huntley, that's probably what you're looking for. Maybe yeah. a little bit more arm strength. Yeah, they've, they've had some good ones over the years. They've drafted in mid and late rounds, um, and guys who who actually gave them some playing time. Chris Redmond was a three. So he gave the Ravens a little bit. He actually went to the 2002 season with him as the starter. And then the other guy is Anderson, who didn't play for the Ravens, but ended up being a, you know, a decent quarterback for the Browns for a couple of years there. So, um, yeah. you know, a guy who, who could help. And I think he was a six, too, so really not a particularly high draft pick. Uh, that's, uh, I think it was a six, yeah. Another big loss today, um, I think today it was official, maybe it was yesterday, it was official, Kevin Zeitler to the Lions. Um, one year, I, I I think it is one year, by the way. Money has not been disclosed. There's no, t- there's no contract saw, out there, no TC. One year, six million. Holy mackerel, that's it? Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. heartbreaking. I mean, Simpson goes for two years, 18 million, and I, I hear it's two million, two years, 12 million with – other incentives to be earned to get it up to 18 million and Zeitler one year, 6 million. Right. Uh, Very surprising to me. That's a, that's a, that's a bargain for a guy that's been one of the league's best pass protecting guards the last three, four years running. And then he's probably going to be a pretty damn good fit with the Detroit lions um, and, and the system they run on offense. I, I would think so. Um, I, you know, there's there's one thing that comes up about the Zeitler deal that's true generally of of a lot of guards, but a lot of guards that got thrown money at this year were younger players like Hunt, like Simpson. Even uh, you know, he's not mm-hmm. a, a real old guy; he's been in the league for four years. Um, but but I mean, then that which is the minimum you could be if you're going to be a UFA. I mean, but but Zeitler, um, there's there's a there's a mechanic in play that if you sign an older player to a two-year contract, you do so at your own peril because there's an old maid syndrome that goes with it. We've talked about it in terms of several Ravens in history. Ed Reed was basically wanting to renegotiate his contract every year. Marshall Yonda at the end, you know, got a two to make one deal. Derek mm-hmm. Mason got, I think, more than one two to make one deal towards the end of his career with the Ravens. So you, know, you don't want to be stuck in this thing where you're constantly re- re- renegotiating a two-year deal for one year with your player. You want a guy who's going to sign for two years and play for two years. And I thought it was a miracle in some ways that Zeitler made it through the entire three years with the Ravens, three years for $22.5 million for what Kevin Zeitler gave the Ravens, absolute freaking steal, absolute yes. steal. One of the greatest free agent signings in Ravens history. I agree. I agree. And I agree that he is was aging, um, but for only a one-year deal, only for $6 million, I would have made that. I would have taken that chance. The only thing that really makes sense to me is they just really, really want to give Ben Cleveland a shot at his natural position, a right guard. That's the only reason it really makes sense. There's there's something else going on here, too, and I think it's the Orioles kind of are running into this a lot, is that they have a pretty decent set of outfielders, for example, in um, uh, Mullins and Hayes and Santander. And they are bad, but they're not also the strength of the team. OK, mm-hmm. those three guys are not are not the strength of the team. And then they've got this incredible core of outfielders coming up. So the Ravens had to, at some point, and this may be the case with both Seitler and Moses, say, look, we've got to move on. We have a chance to get cheaper and we have a really legitimate chance with Cleveland and Voorhees to have players who are pretty good, you know, 80-20 rule. And we can we can get younger at the positions. Voorhees in particular could give them a multi a four year option on a player if he works right. out. And and that's what the Orioles have. The Orioles have you, you have Santander, and for one year, and the last year of his arbitration, I believe, is this year. Mm-hmm. Um, or you could just let him go, not pay that money. And the, you know, the Orioles have been so dollar conscious. I would I would have completely understood it from that respect, and give the job to Cowser or Stowers or whoever. And now they only have four total roster spots in the outfield, typically that they would assign, and they just they don't have room for all the guys. So some right. some one or two players of Cowser. Um, Kerstad and um, Stowers are going to are going to start the year in Triple A, and you know in the infield, same problem. You know, you got M- Mateo and Arias, and and yeah. uh, 
and and then they have uh, you know potentially a player like Norby gets sent back to the minor leagues before it. I don't think it'll affect Jackson Holiday, but it affects a player like Norby. The Mayo too. Mayo's, Mayo, good point. Had a good spring. Um, yeah, you'd like to flip some of those older guys for maybe a relief a relief arm. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, really sad to see that. Um, a happy Kevin Zeitler got to get a shot with a contender, so that's positive. Maybe the Detroit Lions make a Super Bowl finally with some of his leadership, but uh, uh, definitely a, a heartbreaking amount of money the Ravens are letting him go for in, in terms of my view of it. I agree. I agree. Um, so update the comp pick formula. The Ravens are currently plus six, maximum of four. That plus six includes the fourth for PQ, and three sixth rounders. So uh, still a couple more moves to, to uh, impact that to go. Okay. And and you've included in that, and that's just, that's just the recent OTC projection of those most recent. Yes. yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. So that's good. Okay. So, so the one, the Henry deal canceled out a, the Simpson pick. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And okay. Very good. Very good. So that's a pretty good place to be. If they ended up with a fourth and three six, that's a pretty good amount of compensatory capital. Um, the last time they Gino, the Henry one canceled out Gino, not okay, Simpson. Very good. Simpson remained. Yep. Simpson remains and is a six, which Correct. is surprisingly a little bit surprisingly low given the two years eighteen million. Thought he could have been a little bit higher, but that's okay. All right, let's take a look at the remaining UFAs the, the Ravens have, and then we'll we'll call it a, a show here. Um, most important by far still is the one at the top of the list, and that's uh, Jadavian Clowney. Completely agree. It would be fantastic if the Ravens can buttress that outside linebacker one position. Um, I thought you could make a case that Clowney was the second or third best defender on the team last year, in my view. Um, if you can – Take take that check that box off before the draft. Then you can go into the draft with pretty much free ability to go after offensive linemen, cornerbacks, and receivers. So I would I, at this point of the jumpstart of the offseason, at this point of the team's trajectory, I would pay I would pay up for Jadavian Clowney. What, what's your number? Ten. I'd go to ten. Okay. T- ten one year. Ten. Tack on some void, probably they would do, and yeah. then season ticket holders are looking at paying for that in the future. All right, I, I I could live with it. I mean, he's he's worth it in in terms of dollars. I don't know what he'll, what he's going to try and sign for. There's still some teams he's talking to, including the Panthers, who have some cap space, and uh, I mean they're going to be able to pay more. It's just it's just that simple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dalvin Cook, I'm not expecting him back, particularly with the Derrick Henry signing. You never know, I guess, in terms of uh, how he might be a midseason guy, uh, a guy they're still are aware of, has played in the system last year, who they, you know, still think now is only two years removed at this point from the end of a four year, fi- uh, 5,000 yard run. Yeah, yeah, it seemed to, uh, he lost it quickly. He had that one decent run, I think it was his first carry, and then didn't do too much more. It'll be a little bit interesting to see how they address or how they enter the season at running back three. If Keaton Mitchell isn't ready to go week one, I don't think he will be. You don't necessarily want to use a fifth round pick on a back to fill that for half the season. And then the second half of the season, you're stuck carrying four running backs and going short somewhere else on the roster. So I think a player like Cook maybe could make sense or an undrafted free agent probably makes the most sense to, to give you that first half season bridge to Mitchell. Okay. And, and he'd be a practice squad elevation potentially even for, for mm-hmm. some time if he was needed later due to injuries. So you'd, you'd have some, have some options. If you have a good player at running back, you, good chance you're going to lose him through that process. The Ravens have, have lost right. Mizell and Mostert through that process. And, and mm-hmm. they're, they're guys certainly that uh, went on to do some things that were positive. And they've, and they've picked up players that way, too. They picked up Collins through that process. So, uh, you know, it is possible you gain. What uh, J.K. Dobbins, you still put the chance for extremely low he would return? Extremely low. Uh, with Henry as the lead back, I don't see why he would want to come back. Okay. Mustafa, you mentioned early, good good depth at center uh, with that. Uh, didn't see anything positive out of him at guard this year. That was only just a very few snaps. Um, but you do need a backup center. And so the Ravens have to decide 
would they be okay if they had to put McCarry there for a time and then either had to be naked at left tackle or have to train one of their guards to play center? I suppose a player like Voris could could be the backup center if 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 necessary, but there's a lot more to it than just sticking somebody in that spot and expecting him to start making right. shotgun snaps. Yeah. Well, and they're big guy. I mean, Voris would be a pretty big center, one of the biggest yeah. centers I think in the league. And then you have maybe some leverage issues. Um, yeah, I'd like to bring Mustafer back. You know, if he signs again for the veteran minimum, and then you have that, uh, you know, veteran offset where you get a little bit of money credited back to the cap. It's pretty much the same price as a rookie or a, even an undrafted rookie. There's only a few hundred thousand dollar difference. So yeah, I'd like to have him back if you can. I, I would too, and I think uh, I think the reason the Ravens haven't moved on it is they, they kind of want to wait till after the draft to see where they are because. You know, if they've got 12 linemen after the draft because they go cr- go crazy drafting them, then there isn't a lot of point to 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 do that to Mustafer. You could yeah, you could ask him to come in and say, "Hey, we can't give you any guaranteed money, but you know, come on in and 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 you're you're on the list of people we're we're seriously considering because you can play backup center." They could try and sell it to him like that, but I don't I don't think it's he's the kind of player that you you throw a significant amount of guaranteed money at. And I'm, I'm talk, when I say that, I mean about 150 thousand and up. Let's say that I don't think they would do that to just guarantee his spot on the 90 with no chance or a limited chance at the 53. Agree. And he didn't have anything guaranteed last year, if I recall, because he was a handshake, the old guy. And then he went down to the practice squad for about two, three weeks. And then when Mustafer had the high ankle sprain, that's when he was finally promoted. And then he stuck, stuck out the rest of the way. So if you can do that again, but then maybe again, he maybe he puts tape that he put out last year playing for the Ravens boosts his market value a little bit. Yeah, it obviously was pretty decent at center this last year, so I wouldn't I wouldn't disagree with that at all. Let's move on. Kyle Van Noy, um, you know he is a pretty good Sam option for the Ravens. Now the Ravens are are pretty one of the big stark contrasts between the Martindale defense and the McDonald defense is the much lesser utilization of Sam's to drop. Now, he some of that is he's willing to drop anybody. He drops both Matabike and Pierce on a number mm-hmm. of plays from the middle of the of the yep. defensive line. <laughs> um, you know, so he'll he'll drop other people other than just a Sam. And we're we're going to talk later today about Matt Judon's career with the Ravens, and mm-hmm. his was characterized as being a very frequent dropper, much like Bowser. Um, and being a guy who really generated a lot of flexibility for the for the blitz. The Ravens don't have that guy right now, and Van Noy is probably the closest thing on the market. He's got over 1,500 career. I think it's over 1,500. I looked at it last year, but over 1,500 career coverage snaps. So definitely a guy who has experience there, uh, probably a little bit uh, long in the tooth to be doing as much covering on a rate basis today, but it could still provide you with some flexibility. Yeah, yeah. No, he was a tremendous addition last year. Really just seemed to step up and make a play when he needed a play to be made. Kind of had an uncanny ability for that. The the aspect of being a true three-down, multifaceted outside backer certainly brings value. Um, I think five outside linebackers is probably the max they want to carry yeah. on the 53. So I would say there's probably room for one veteran. And then they, you know, they have some younger guys coming up that they don't want to necessarily block. Tavius Robinson, uh, Malik Harrison brought back now, and even um, what's the name of the uh, Ajabo? Not Ajabo. well, of course Ajabo, but the uh, Malik Ham is the other one I'm looking for. Yeah, might have something to say. He might have something to say at training camp about that. So it probably, I think you're probably looking for one outside backer. I prioritize Clowney above Van Noy clearly, but. If you have to fall back to the Illinois, that's a that's a decent option too. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it, uh, I, I think the biggest fear in there for me is the Ravens have no idea what they're going to get from Ajabo. And if Ajabo was going to be able to fill on a percentage of snaps basis what Van Noy and Clowney did this last year, and basically all three of those guys, including Owe, played roughly two thirds of the snaps. Okay, mm-hmm. and and the other thing is the Ravens hardly ever kicked anybody inside. Um, uh, this year, they did very little of that the entire season. Um, so when when I when I see that playing out like that, I would agree with you. First of all, you need less outside linebackers if you're not going to kick an outside linebacker inside pretty much ever. Okay, mm-hmm. they did a little bit of it. They did a little bit with all three of those guys in particular, on, but it was it was very limited. Um, if they uh, if 
if they were sure of a job, then they would have no problem with that. I'm as unsure about a job as I am of, of any player on the roster in terms of where he's going to be. The, 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 I wouldn't say the sky's the limit anymore. I think there is a ceiling that is, that is, is coming down, uh, but they're still, mm-hmm. still got a little bit of headroom there. And the floor um, has dropped <laughs> in terms of mm-hmm. what it, what it could be. Um, but he's, but there's a wide, wide variation of where he could end up from basically not ever being a productive NFL player to still being a pretty darn good pass rusher, at least on a situational basis. Yes, that's how I see him. Hopefully, I think that's probably the ceiling for the next season as a situational designated pass rusher. He was struggling tremendously to fit the run even before he was injured last year or right. the training camp. So uh, I'd be – fortunately, you do have Tavius, who was pretty decent against the run, and Malik Harrison was pretty good against the run. Neither of those are great pass rush uh, specialists, so maybe you have sort of a platoon system there between those three younger guys that works out okay. But you still need a little somebody else with a little bit more proven track record and and a known commodity on the other side of away. The, those guys you just mentioned, both Tavius and Malik, are, are good snap eaters. Tavius doesn't have a huge special teams role. Malik, of course, is on all the units, but 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 Tavius does not have a huge special teams role, which means he's a guy who often gets left off the game, or or is at the risk of being left yeah. off the game day roster if all he's going to do is play, you know, eight or nine snaps on first down run defense paired with Harrison. Right. And I think he could actually be the one that maybe makes sense to kick inside in your in your race yeah. car package. He, I think he, I actually I think he did some of his best work as far as collapsing the pocket from one aligned further inside last year. So so the Ravens situation this year, though, is even better on the inside than it was last year when they were not at all tempted to, to run these mm-hmm. kick inside packages. But Travis Jones, have, you know, really emerged in the second half of last year as a as a as a pass rusher. So I think you're going to want him there. Obviously, you're not taking Matabike off the field on passing situations on any time. It's significant. And Michael Pierce is still a hell of a pass rusher. He generates mm-hmm. pressure. They love to stunt with him. Uh, he's a great pairing with Matabike in terms of body types. Um, mm-hmm. and to have two guys, including one who can certifiably make space with a bull rush and another who can who can uh, work off that. Uh, I just I, I think there's a there's. They've got the they've got the horses inside, and they those are the guys they really I think should be confident in um, being, you know, half of that four man front. Yeah, yeah. If they could bring Clowney back, I don't see why they wouldn't be up close to the league leading sacks again. I mean, they're, they're retaining the entire defensive line. Simpson, from what we saw, is probably can 80 do 80 percent of the blitzing that queen did mm-hmm. and you have everybody else coming back and I, so yeah I, I think they had the makings of a very good pass rush just need that one veteran edge to, to round it all out i think i think i think it would take luck to get to 60 snaps again because i think a lot of it was, was the genius of scheme that mcdonald had so we'll see first of all that or has got to bring some of that and some of that's got to be in their dna and the other thing i think it's got to be a job has got to have a breakout to, to hit 60 mm-hmm. sacks again uh yeah. i i uh yeah. Anyway, so it's a. Uh, um, I, I would I would vote pretty heavily. I, I would I would bet pretty heavily. I'd say against against sixty snaps if uh, if anyone sure. making that prop to me. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Daryl Worley still out there. I think he's still very likely to return. Uh, the Ravens are so in need of safeties. In fact, it, it kind of is amazing to me they haven't made that move already. Mm-hmm. Um, they clearly love the guy from what he did in twenty three. How they had 18 transactions involving him at 22. You know, you think guy who's cut that often and brought up from the practice squad and he's on, you know, elevations and releases and all these things that many times you think, Oh, he's just on the fringe of the roster. Uh, uh-uh. That's very clearly the Ravens love that player. Yeah. Th- I, I really hope they do find a way to bring him back. He's a handshake guy too. So you have a little mm-hmm. bit more roster flexibility there. You need at least two safeties. You need to add at least two safeties yeah. to the depth chart, if not three. Yeah. To even you know, so to me, that's pretty much a no-brainer. Um, gives he brings you a lot. He really does. So, so here's my thinking on the on the safety position and numbers you need. If you're never going to play the dime defense, then you need your base two plus you need Hamilton plus you need one other player on game day if any injury happens at any position so you're not forced to screw with where you play Hamilton. And they already had that come up that they were they were Hamilton missed some time due to that the the, the mm-hmm. one hit that that he missed half a game for and then and then he also had to go back to play on the back end because of injuries on multiple occasions whether it was Williams 
might have been Steven Stone, might have missed a little bit of time. Not 100% sure about that one. Um, Daryl Worley got hurt one week after he played 102 snaps or, or, or so. So you don't want to be put in that position, which means you have to have four safeties active on game day, which probably means you need five on the roster. Yeah. And if you want to do any play with dime at all, you also need to make sure you have five for that. And, and, and the Ravens are the most extreme team in the league in terms of the potential to have four safeties on the field at a time. Um, which which really means I think they need to have five on the roster, and that means they've got to go out and find maybe a UDFA guy, maybe a maybe a veteran, uh, cheap free agent, and they're very good at identifying the guys who fit their needs exactly there. Um, but it, the, the the guy that is draftable and 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 you know could be just about anywhere in the draft would be a a, a back end split field safety, much in the mold of Stone, somebody with yes. good instincts, somebody who who can maintain that cover too uh if if Worley were to go down for example yes we're in lockstep as far as, as the way we see the safety situation at this point mm-hmm. uh what else painful process really painful process to go through this and player after player gets lost I, I I'm probably and in, 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 you listeners can can tell that boss is just telling me the Zeitler news for the first time on the show, obviously. And it's, it, it hurts like hell to see him go for $6 million. I'm telling you that. Um, but the Ravens have, uh, you know, a lot of decisions to make and every single decision they make involving money has to be looked at with increased scrutiny on Jackson's second contract here. Completely agree. They are up close to the lead, if not the, the number one lead in adjusted games lost, which is a metric that tracks sort of your, your credits and your debits on the roster, who you added, who, you lo- who you're mm-hmm. losing. Um, and they usually are. I mean, most years they are. The beautiful thing of last year was DaCosta was able to backfill with pedigree, a former first round overall pick, uh, a, a guy with a, a Darby who had a really has had a fine career. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we can do that again, it works out great. But you can't always do that. The players have to be available, and they have to be wanting to come to you for the right price. So that's the that's the trick of it all. Yeah, it was a was a remarkable year in terms of free agent signings last year for DaCosta, and you rarely get value like that. Normally, uh, you know, a lot of people just tell you free agents don't move the needle at all in terms of of what they give you for value. And the the, the problem is they're market value players. So you know, the the, 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 the you have to get so much more from them for them to be really big game players your gains come from your young players it's from giving a young player a chance and getting more than what you expected because they're making almost nothing and then you get multiple years of that and you you can high five each other in the front office over that one till the cows come home because that's where your money is really made Um, it is not on free agent signings the derrick henry signing it could work out for the ravens it's not going to it, – I, I, it'd be very difficult for me to see circumstances where they get so much above market value for Derrick Henry. And he's pretty cheap. You know, he's, right. he's reasonably cheap. I mean, um, it, 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 if they if they re-sign Jadavian Clowney for $10 million, it'd be a, it'd be a good signing. I'd be happy with it. I think it fills a hole. But on the other hand, I don't think they're going to get 150% of that in terms of value from Clowney. Yeah, well, his 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 contributions were valued at about fifteen million last year, and I think Henry's were valued at about twelve million, if I recall. But uh, yeah, it's it's and the other piece of it is the really really premium elite difference makers. They don't ever hit free agency. They're tagged or they're traded a year before. I mean, look at the way the Ravens had to go out and, and get Roquan, um, and that's just that's just how it is now. Um, so. <clears throat> Yeah, just continuing the draft and nine draft picks now, I believe, and try to build the best 60, 60 player roster you can. And if a few guys, if you if you help, if you end up with a Caillou Blue Kelly Lemon, don't be afraid to cut bait soon on them either. Yeah. All right. I, I, that's a good point from last year, and obviously very frustrating that the Ravens in recent years really haven't hit on their mid round corners at all. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, Voss, always a pleasure to do this show with you and talk football. Tell folks where they can find your work online. My pleasure, Ken. On Twitter, X at Vasilis Beatdown, V-A-S-I-L-I-S Beatdown, co-managing editor and author for Baltimore Beatdown Block. 
All right. Other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, hit me up. DMs are always open on Twitter. I want to talk to you about anything this offseason. We are primarily on draft content right now. If you have a draft topic, let's talk about that before the draft when the interest is higher. Unless you want to talk draft metrics, that can be after the draft. Uh, if you want to talk anything else about franchise building, about scheme, about uh, any two-part series that you've dreamed of doing, and I've got get a lot of good ideas for this kind of thing. I really want to talk to you about that. Always looking for uh, uh, for new folks to to uh, meet and talk football with. It's an open mic look, and we have the recollection series, of course. Just tell me the player from the Ravens past you want to talk to me about. Uh, one is out on Kelly Gregg that was a lot of fun to do in terms of what he brought to the Ravens over the years, and uh, uh, I think he's a favorite of a, a lot of players. I'd like to hear about your favorite player, too. For Vasilikos, this is Ken McCusick saying goodbye, and we'll talk to you next week on Friday Morning GM.